Hi, Mike. Good to have you on the podcast. My pleasure. <laughs> so for everyone who doesn't know you, who doesn't know what you do, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'm Mike Cernovich. I'm a journalist, author, filmmaker. I know people like Hardy from the mindset world from way back in the day. That's actually where I'm It's probably what I care most about, even though uh, I directly do it the least. I feel like indirectly I do it every day because I show people what you can do if you apply the mindset principles to your own life. <laughs> so um, let's dive deeper into your life story. So I know you had a, a rough uh, upbringing. So could could you please speak a little bit about that? And maybe um, for everyone who's going through, t we could share a lesson or two um, from, from your past. Well, yeah, it's no secret. I grew up, I was, grew up in a poor house. It's all relative now, of course. I've lived in, in you know, Vietnam and gone to Cambodia and other places. So uh, everything is relative, but social status is also relative. So the way the way you feel is subjective and it's based on the relative status of other people. That's something that isn't talked about often enough. And we were we, we were objectively poor by American standards, well below the poverty level. In the United States, there's a, a way to measure this. There's a poverty level. And we were, of course, below that, a family of six. My dad was a couple years completely out of work, and we were on food stamps. And when he had a job, it was maybe $10,000 a year. Now, mm -hmm. granted, that was, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. But that, that wasn't even inflation adjusted. That's not really any money. Uh, and, how could your family live on this? I think that's, that's like nothing, right? Right. Well, look, and a lot of families had to figure that out. Luckily for us, my dad was very devout Christian. No, no smoking, no, no drinking, no, no vices. So, and we had uh, grandparents who my grandfather was a state trooper and he had a pension and he had a, a family side business. And so, so grandma and grandpa would sort of kick in and help out here and there. But yeah, it's a great question. There were four kids, one bathroom in the house six people total ten thousand dollars a year that's yeah yeah the math is <laughs> the, the math is kind of scary and, doesn't work right <laughs> yeah yeah the math the math doesn't work and things that i didn't appreciate as a kid but i do now my grandparents they paid off the mortgage on my parents home which is interesting to me as an as an adult for a number of reasons one is You were, it was $250 a month was their mortgage. That would, would be like a ton of money if you're making right $10,000 a year. Yeah. That, that's a full paycheck and, and change after tax. That's a ton of money. And secondly, as I'm older, I'm like $25,000 for a house, right? How is <laughs> that even a mortgage, right? Like what, what you know, what, what the heck? So my grandparents definitely were were major major we'd be in a lot of trouble probably if if we hadn't had their support yeah okay so 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 basically your your grandparents were helping your father out right yeah but not day to day but in the sense oh. of my grandma always made sure we had a nice christmas and they did pay off the mortgage so you think if with no mortgage $10,000. I think it's my dad's paychecks. I would see the pay stubs. They were $200 after taxes and you get paid every week. So what is that? 800 a month or uh, mm -hmm. it's mind blowing, right? I mean, it's yeah. just, a, uh, uh, I was always like a curious kid and would always look into things and yeah, 205 bucks a month. So he started at 850, then ended up making 12, $12 and 50 cents an hour. And so after tax payment, you know, 200 bucks a, a week, Even, you know, even 30 years ago, that's not any money. That, 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 yeah. <laughs> But I guess without a mortgage and we didn't take vacations, we never had a house that was, you know, nice. We couldn't take trips anywhere because the car might, I, you know, my stories, and this is probably true of most people in America who grew up poor is you, your car breaking down is like a thing. You're just, is the car going to start when you get in there? there's like a, a sound it makes yeah, when the, when the freaking, ignition right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it works <laughs> yeah there, when your ignition won't turn over and if you drive 
your car, you might make it an hour, but then it might just break down on the side of the road. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. And the, these are the day-to-day. -day, this is the thing about growing up poor is if you haven't grown up poor or if you're like me and, you know, you're not poor at all anymore, you, just the day-to-day -day things like that. Will my car start? Well, no. Well, if your car doesn't start, there's a whole cascade of events. You can't get to work. You can't take your kids to work or you can't take your kids to school. You it just sets off a whole spot. Now you're late for work. How many times have you been late for work and you lose your job? There's a whole cascade of events just for something very basic like transportation, right? Every, everywhere you look, because in America, you're not going to starve. And that's why I think a lot of people in, in America are a little glib about poverty. They go, oh, well, nobody's starving in America. And yeah, that's true. And that's great. And I've well, been to places yeah, where people are still broke, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been there, but there's no way to ever to ever get above your station in life if you're you don't know if your car is going to start it's just at any number of minor frustrations you're always on the precipice of one shocking event one family illness one sickness one job loss one something and you you're completely homeless at that point so um you could also uh, could you also please speak a little bit about um, your childhood because um, I also know you were bullied as a kid and um, you, you had a tough time in school. So maybe you could teach a lesson or two ab about this whole bullying thing and in, in your childhood childhood. Well, yeah, I, ha I had kind of, you know, everything rigged against me as a kid, probably. Oh, there, I wasn't black in America, which is a little <laughs> different. So, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, other than being black in America, I, I had I was had a pretty rigged I, childhood yeah. asthma, was fat, poor. So the, I, the, the unholy trifecta, I, I had it all. And you don't bullying is a weird thing because you never know why. Like, why me? Right. You yeah. just my number came up. There was no reason. There was no why to it. You, when you're a kid, you try to think, why me? And there was no why. It's just your number came up. It could have been the other kid. It could have, there, there were 10 other kids, probably more bullyable than me. I wasn't even the most bullyable kid out of all of them, right? But your, your number comes up just by bad luck. And that, that's your life. So you start to get bullied and you're, you're going to get bullied your whole life or you're going to have to fight back against the bullies. And that presents its own sort of challenges. And, and that's how you also got into fighting, right? Like yeah. So my dad, so as, as poor as we grew up, as poor as we grew up, uh, you never hear me complain, uh, cr criticize my dad, even though he's probably objectively worthy of criticism. Like, why didn't you, you know, he, my dad has a high IQ like me. Like, why didn't you figure out how to start a business? Or why didn't you figure out this? Why didn't you figure out that? Why didn't you hustle a little? There's yeah. objectively speaking, I could probably <laughs> find many, many criticisms, but he, I just view it as he was like everybody in the world programmed and he was running a program that was an entrepreneurial. You didn't know that you could learn to be an entrepreneur. You either had business and so you didn't. And no, that, that isn't, that isn't really it. I remember Six preparing. Six mindset, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just, you, you run that. And so my dad did the best with the, the software that he had. So I've never really complained about him. So he took me to martial arts, got me into martial arts, which I didn't take that seriously, but then took more seriously and started fighting back a lot. <laughs> so um, you could also uh, tell us a little bit about your 20s because I think um, your, your, your story in your 20s is also amazing. You were reading a lot of books. Um, you, you were in the army, right? And um, uh, you, 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 you eventually became a lawyer. So, so tell us a little bit about that part of your life because I really think it's, it's, fasc it's fascinating. Yeah, so... Okay, so that's a good one um, for a number of reasons. Because it, it shows it shows like a pattern, I guess, of life, which is to this day, probably why I'm very compassionate to people, but also not is I just as a kid, I, I, I figured this stuff out reading books in a library, right? Like there was no boxing coaches where I grew up. So I remember specifically reading a book, Better Boxing for Boys. And it was just some you know, little thing. Here's how you have a stance. Here's how you throw a punch. <laughs> and then when men come to me, oh, how do I, how do I do this? How do I do that? I'm like, just go away from me. You know, what is wrong with you? I was eight years old in the library of my public school, read, you know, reading books to figure it out. Why don't you just go figure it out? Read, read some books, right? There's endless, endless material now that you can yeah. learn from. 
And so as a kid, I just read books and I read magazines and I did what the, like the magazines said uh, or the books or whatever. They, they struck me as credible. Maybe that now what we know about fake news and everything, maybe that wasn't the best uh, approach, but at the time it, it seemed credible. All this <laughs> stuff worked and you, you know, you follow workout programs and everything. And you, you find if you realize like your body got tougher. One, one thing you learn about people is just how afraid everybody is of being hit. The first time a person's hit, they, they go into like anaphylactic shock or something, right? But once you've been hit yeah. a number of times, it it isn't really that big of a deal, right? It, it isn't fun. And sure, you can get knocked out to hit you at the right angle. You can always tell guys who've never fought, actually, because they'll talk really tough, but then they'll act as if being hit is the end of the world. No, I mean, <laughs> it hurts unless you hit in the right place. I remember you. I would get into a fight as a kid. And then the next day, you'd feel like like a mild car crash. Your whole body would ache because you know you're fighting and everybody's rolling around and no nobody knows what they're doing at the time. This was before Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, before UFC one. And I just learned that okay, if you can you know condition your body first, you have to condition your mind to face fears, and then you have to simultaneously you're conditioning your body to withstand pain. But that means you have to condition your mind because your mind is what limits. Your pain perception. Your pain perception says, "Oh, that hurts." Well, okay, yeah, it hurts, but you're like ten percent. We're not even. We're not even in the, the the ballpark yet, right? We're we're still warming up here, and then your mind has to learn how to to push through the pain, and then your mind then your mind becomes tougher, and then of course, but your body can withstand becomes tougher, and that's ultimately the the theory of progressive overload thinking in terms of, you know, specific adaptation to impose demands and weightlifting and everything else. So these, these principles always apply to everything. So, so basically you always were like very curious about, um, several topic, uh, topics and a lot of things, right. And, um, tell us a little bit about like, what are the lessons you have learned along the way in your twenties and and thirties maybe? Well, I mean, there, so as a kid, l luckily I was, we're all born with certain uh, ways. Luckily as a kid, I was born with a lot of curiosity, right? So that, that's a very, and I believe that's to some degree genetic in the big five social personality. They, they call that openness. There, there's five characteristics, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Me, uh, and it's O-C-E-A-N, you can look that up after the podcast. And when me, I'm to this day, low conscientiousness. I, when I was a kid, I had the messiest desk or the second, always my handwriting was the worst. When I get a haircut, I'm 41 year old man. And when I get a haircut, people are like, wow, you're like really handsome, right? Because usually my hair is all this hevel and I, <laughs> I throw it together. I'm always having paperwork to this day, paperwork errors. And, oh, I forgot that thing. And that, so I have to have a whole army of you know, paper pushers around me because they're <laughs> high conscientiousness and I'm low. Yeah. So that it, it doesn't mean one's better than the other, but when in terms of uh, openness, I've, I've taken the test before I'm like 99th percentile for me, it's like, you want to go do that? F it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's, you want to jump off this? Yeah, let's go do it. Openness to experience, openness to ideas, openness to, um, that's probably why I was, I had a podcast before podcasting was like a big deal. And in 2011, I should have kept it. I was too open to other things. And so one, one thing you learn about yourself is what leads you down the right path can lead you down the wrong path. So <laughs> I was like, you know, early adapter, big blog, you know, big podcast. Yeah. Just had a, a huge online business. And then I go, oh, why don't I just go into journalism? Why not? Why not? Right. Because that's the way <laughs> I always approach the world. And well, I can tell you why not. It's a lot of stress. You become a target. It isn't as fun. Your audience is mean. The people you're around aren't into self-development. In fact, they mock self-development. Oh, and you make less money. So and and it's, 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 it also increased aging, right? <laughs> yeah, I've aged. I look at pictures before I turned gray. That was three years ago, man. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm fasting now and reversing. I'm, I'm in the process of reversing aging. <laughs> and yeah, it, was, it ages you. and It's hard. Is not not just hard, but it's almost impossible. You're meeting people's sources to not drink. There's just a certain vibe where because because when you're you know when you're a young man or even when I was a young man, I'd be like, oh, you know that's an excuse. If you don't want to drink, you don't have to drink. Uh, if you're getting good stories out of people and they're buying rounds and you got that camaraderie and stuff, 
you, you better not be drinking Diet Coke. Sorry for you. That you <laughs> yeah, it, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah, I wish it didn't, but welcome, welcome to America. Whereas the mindset stuff, you go out with guys, if you tell people, I don't know, I'm drinking freaking clenbuterol or something, they'll be like, oh, enjoy, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm juice fasting. I brought my own green juices. People be like, cool, man, you know, you could do the most weird oddball things and nobody would care. But in the real world, if you're not conforming to social norms, which does involve drinking and eating and everything else, you immediately become kind of a freak show or an outcast. All and you don't get, yeah. yeah. It becomes a th like everything becomes a thing. Oh, why are you eating that? Why did you bring your own food? You know, because I'm fat. You're not fat. You look fine. I'm like, I know, but in my world, I'm fat. In my yeah. like, in the world that I live in, I'm fat. And in, in the real world, I look great, right? But everybody go, no, 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 come on, do this, that. So it, it is, it is hard. I actually have said I have a lot of you to their level, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Just everybody has their customs and norms and mores. Just like. You know, you see the guys at the gym with the one gallon jug of water. Nobody needs to carry around a jug of water in the gym, right? <laughs> you don't need to do that. But to them, that's just totally right. normal. It's just that we're, we're you know, or I'm drinking BCAAs during your workout. You know, I, no, you don't need to do Come that. Come on, but, man. <laughs> yeah, but that's normal. So if you were, like, nobody would, nobody would think you were a freak show. But if you brought BCAAs, you know, to Washington, D.C., and you're meeting political people about news stories – Oh they, man! Like this, who, what is this weirdo, right? Who the hell is this person? You would be ostracized immediately, and and in life, conforming in a strategic way is how you get the best information. So, um, basically, um, in your twenties, so 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 let's get back to to your twenties. Um, what would be your advice? Because a lot of listening to the podcast like um what were your own mistakes in your 20s things you have regret and and maybe sp speak to 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 your to the habits that were like like very good for you and um, might be good for our listeners also so well the only the only mistake i probably made well first of all i don't know that i made that many because when i was the 20s i was young gunning and super ambitious if anything it would be like the mistakes i made over the last five years you know what would my 25 year old ambitious uh, you know self say to my say to myself now but the biggest mistake was i knew right away i was in a relationship that wasn't going to last okay just i just knew it just knew it and then breaking up is hard to do like the song just break up just break if you're a guy you have just break up i think a ton of guys in my age do this like they yeah. they just um kind of get with the wrong girl and they know it from day one but they still do it and yeah and breaking up is hard they cry they'll tell you they'll kill themselves you know any number of things so yeah breaking up there's a song in america from like the 60s really old song breaking up is hard to do and it is especially if you're a man who's got his like life together they don't want to let you go but they don't want to change either that's another thing the, the <laughs> lessons that i wish i learned, right like oh don't break up with me okay well then do x y and z Right. It, it's just like when you're in a, in a relationship with a woman and you're like she's being mean or something and you just leave the room and then she comes in the room and is like, OK, you're in a bad mood. Go be in a bad mood by yourself. And then you're in car. They drive away and then they're like trying to chase you down and <laughs> just go, go be. That's why when I'm in a bad mood, you know what I do? First of all, it rarely happens. I go be by myself because I don't want to con contagious other people. Yeah. I'm like, OK, I'm not on my game. I'm going to go turn the lights off, lay down and be by myself. But with the females, it's not always, you know, quite that easy. And they want to work that out. I, I think a, a lot of listeners could, could, can relate to the story. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in terms of relationships, I never had a scarcity mindset because I was like, women would make it known pretty clear that they were interested in me. So I, a lot of guys, you know, they really have to, you know, I have a lot of blessings, you know, six foot tall, broad shoulders, um, you know, a lot of good things going for me. So it wasn't <laughs> even a scarcity mindset. It was just in terms of they, they you know, you got to realize a, a lesson than the men out there. They're going to be OK. Like they'll find somebody within a month. If you're with an attractive woman and you feel like, oh, I don't want to break your heart. That's ter no, no, no. She'll be so fine and good to go within a month. Attractive women don't remain single that long anyway. So I wish I wish somebody had told me a number of things. One is 
as a man, you're not in your peak till your late 20s. 28 to 36 is going to be prime time. I'm 41 and still, if I were single, I wouldn't be having any problems at all. But it's still not as good as when I was like 33, you know. It's, it's just <laughs> <laughs> so just know prime time is 28 to 36. So if you're 25, why would you settle down? You, you, you're not getting the best that you could get. The best that you can get is when you're like 34. Then you get the best that you can get. Don't don't do that. And you, oh, but I don't want to break anybody's heart. She's going to be fine. And then, of course, men who are like, well, what if I don't find anyone else? I, I just don't have time for those people. They can go on their, <laughs> their self form to something, you know, go cry, go cry to somebody else. I don't care about that with that kind of thinking. Um, so basically, one big mistake that people do in their 20s and 30s um, is they, they get into the wrong type of relationships. What are like other common mistakes or maybe mistakes that most people are not even aware of? So um, speak a little bit to that and, and, and please give your best advice for people in their tr 20s, mid 20s. And yeah. Well, you need to have a better social circle of aspirational people. If you're in your early 20s, odds are you're not going to be around billionaires, right? And if they were, it'd be a rich kid Instagram. So it's a different thing. But there are people who are aspirational who aren't. People who are trying to pressure you to go, let's go out and get drunk or whatever. You should not be drinking in your 20s. You should not be getting drunk in your 20s. You should be reading books, learning skills. I, I wrote, a, I, I don't know if the article's still up, but years ago I wrote one. And this is what you should learn. You don't learn in college. You should be reading, you know, Ben Settle's book on copywriting, Dan Kennedy, Jeff Walker's launch. James Altucher, Choose Yourself. Great. Uh, people like Gary Vee stuff uh, never really resonate with me, but maybe I just, but for younger audience, maybe that resonates with them. You, you need to be at the gym. You need to be grinding all the time. And you can party in your 30s when you can just pull out the card. Oh, I can't get in, can't get reservations. Well, I'll just get a table, right? Because $1,000 for a table just isn't like a thing, right? That's where you want to be at life. And like when I would go to Vegas with my friends in my early 30s, we'd go in to excess or whatever and just, OK, we want a cabana, you know, minimum thousand, you know, you're, and you're with other successful people. So it only ends up being a couple hundred bucks each anyway. It doesn't even end up being a lot of money, but you're not stressing about it or checking your accounts or and, and whatnot. And, and that's what you want to be aspiring to. And not in your 20s and drinking 75 cent beers or dollar beers or euro <laughs> beers. <laughs> Like most people in their 20s have their priorities backwards, right? Because like in their 30s, they try to make money and they try to live to the good life or, or try to have the good life. And in, in, in their 20s, they're all about dating and partying and women and yeah, just uh, wasting their time, basically, I guess, right? Yeah, there was an article I wrote many, many years ago. Don't waste your 20s because your brain is called neuroplasticity. It is a biological reality. So at my age at 41, I'm a very wise guy. Why am I a wise man? Because when I was in my 20s, I'm, I'm, it's compounded interest, all the knowledge I learned, everything I learned, all the skills I acquired. And they, they synthesize as you get older. But if you're not in your 20s reading every book of math, because your brain just takes in information. You learn new skills faster. Everything is fresh. Everything is new. And then as you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, you can still learn, but it's a different process. Your your memory isn't going to be – your working memory isn't going to be the same as it was when you were in your 20s. But if you have everything loaded in your mind, then like me, I'm great. I, I, people my age say, oh, I feel like I'm losing a step or this. I'm like, I I don't. But then again, I in my, in my 20s, I filled my mind up. So for me, I, I'm not – if I were and in my 20s – you're always yeah. working out, eating healthy, juicing, right? Yeah. So yeah, if I'd been in my 20s not learning things, then maybe, yeah, maybe I would feel that way. But instead, I'm always like when I when I pause, that's why when people meet me in real life, they kind of it takes a while to get used to me because I'm not really looking at you. I'm like always looking in my mind reverse, you know, like so most people look out and mine is mind is always looking in. And I'm always looking in like retrieving information, yeah. but you have to have information to retrieve. Most people haven't, right? <laughs> right, yeah. You need to build, when, especially when you're young and fresh and your mind is sharp, you need to load everything that you possibly can because you're going to be going into that well of knowledge for the rest of your life. 
So I think your advice is uh, amazing so far. Um, like, l let's let's give our listeners something practical because I think like uh, you are also a big fan of, of uh, Lindy books, like like reading Nietzsche and and Ayn Rand and um, Emerson, and and speak a little bit about like good books um, you would recommend to our listeners. Yeah, I used to have a reading list, and I should dig that up, but. The, you want to you want to read across genres. Um, definitely, you want to read you want to read across genres. Genres. So, you want to you know you want to read a good fitness book. You want to read good fiction. I, I like um, Neil Stevenson quite a bit. The Snow Crash is a great Snow book Crash, to read. Yeah. Blood Meridian is a great book because it's a book about you know the primal human experience. You should be learning everything you can about marketing, persuasion, storytelling. There's a book Wired for Story that you can read about how to structure a story properly. You want to that usually want to read what I call it's called the five book rule and you want to read five books in a category. So if you read five marketing books, you you got it down. You're not going to be the expert but you got it. if you it read 80%, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you read Jeff Walker launch, James Alt Altucher choose yourself, Dan Kennedy's the No BS Kick Butt Guide to Long Form Marketing, Ben Settles Copyright Secrets. You're, I mean, you're, you're good. You're good. Like you, you're good. You're, you're not gonna be that. You're good. But then if you read <laughs> that, and then you read five great works of fiction. So you read, say, Snow Crash, Blood Meridian, Catch Twenty Two. We'll, we'll say um, crime and punishment, and then you want to read something from a uh, female, female genre, interpretive maladies. There you go. That's a good one. And because that's like cross cultural. So yeah. it's largely it's an Indian author, and it's quite the stories are quite moving collection of st short stories. So you read f and those five aren't the magic books, so it's just five cross yeah, genres. Yeah, just happens. have in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So now you know, now you know marketing. Because you read Dan Kennedy, Ben Saddle, Jeff Walker. And then now you know storytelling and good fiction. Now you know how to compel a story. And, and then you learn, okay, you need to learn um, persuasion, specifics of persuasion. Then you would read Milton Erickson, My Voice Will Go With You. Great Jerry book. Spence, great, great book. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry Spence, How to Argue Win Every Time. A couple of Adams. Yeah, you yeah you get the point. You read five there, and then now you say, okay, I know there's a methodology to persuasion. I know what a beautiful, moving story looks like. To compound, right? Yeah. And then oh, and I know how to market. So if you can tell great stories, you know persuasion is you know how to market because you might read a book on persuasion, but the book on persuasion by Milton Erickson, my voice will go with you. That won't tell you that you need to have an offer and a, and a call to action. The offer needs to be a converting offer. See. If you read just the marketing books, you won't know about Milton Erickson, but you'll know, okay, there's a structure. All right, there needs to be a call to action. There needs to be an offer. Is the offer converting? Why isn't the offer converting? Okay, and then I, oh, I've read great works of literature, so now I know how to tell very human stories. I know how when I'm marketing to create that human connection to people, the vulnerability, the plot line, the, the antagonist, the, the drama, the conflict. And, 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 that's, and that just, that, you can do that in six months. Six months, right? That's why I get, guys, are you guys life for, is nice to me, Mike? Yeah. How about you read some books, shut up, go to the gym, leave me alone, leave me alone, just do that. And, and then, because and, the kinds of questions I expect from people is, hey, I started a business. I put in $5,000. I haven't made a single sale. I'm freaking out. What can I do? I'll be like, oh, okay, now we, now we can have a conversation. Now yeah. we can have a conversation. Okay, so what's your business? What's your website? Okay, here's this. Or how do I start people? How do I start a blog? Go away. I, I literally tell people. <laughs> I'm not your Google, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not at the level where <laughs> you can read all that for yourself on your own time. That's not the level we're talking about. <laughs> and if you just read, do the reading, then you'll say, okay, I start a website. What's wrong? And then I'll read your website and I'll say, well, I mean, it sucks. It just doesn't look good. Then, oh, then go read graphics design. What looks good? And everything you're learning is building on everything else that you're learning. And then you end up not knowing everything, but you have a large experience and understanding of life. Great. 
So um, I think like Naval Ravikant also has a saying that that your foundation is very important so that you really start out with the white books. And I think this is also like really, really important because like um, you have mentioned like great, 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 great books. But I think what a lot of listeners in their 20s and even in their 30s and 40s do, they just pick stuff from the bestseller list and um, just read the, the newest stuff and um, really miss out on all the uh, tested and old and, and good books, right? Yeah, you need to have a broad, a broad understanding of the world. You need to read the great works of philosophy. One of the best books I ever read, 19, The Great Dialogues of Plato, because you, you learn the Socratic method. Well, why? What do you mean by this? What about this? What about that? Well, you said that you don't like this. How, how do you go there? Do you find the, the original premises of the, the people's beliefs in the world? And then you learn the boundaries of reasoning, like a reductio ad absurdum and not everything. You can't always find the first cause, but you learn that inquisitiveness. What you, you claim, that's why I'm so good with the media, because they'll attack me with something and I just use a Socratic method. Well, okay, you claim that I've posted a mean tweet. But what about these five tweets? And they go, how dare you ask me about those five tweets? And I would say, well, <laughs> but they, they are relevant because underlying that question is an accusation and underlying that accusa ac um, accusation is allegedly a moral rule. And the moral rule is you can't say these kinds of things. Okay, fine. But why is that moral rule not being applied elsewhere? So that's the way I always in engage with the world is in the Socratic method and you learn that the great dialogues of Plato. It's not even not even a hard read. You read Nietzsche and, and you start just examining the foundations of morality, right? And who created the morality and who who does that benefit? Does the moral does the moral rules benefit you when other people aren't applying them? And you yeah. read your Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics about just how to think and how you define your terms. What is the good life? What is happiness? Who is a good man? What is a virtuous man? Aristotle, I think, Ryan Holiday repopulized Seneca and the Stoics. Somebody like him, there's a good opportunity for an ambitious young man. Is that Aristotle, rediscovering Aristotle, I think will become big, especially as people are beginning to look for virtue. People are saying, okay, I've done the, the, the tender thing, swiped right, been with 100 girls, swiped right, just doesn't feel good. I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about the process. It isn't. And then you start looking at the virtues. Okay, that well, a virtuous man wouldn't do that. A virtuous man would would do the appropriate thing. Well, what's the virtue? How do you discover these virtues? And then as you read Aristotle, you find a lot of guidance in there. Now, of course, the the you know the politically correct people go, oh, well, Aristotle said women and slaves are not able to have a virtue. Da, da, da. It's like just you got to ignore that stuff, right? You're reading an old book. <laughs> you can't cry because he said only high IQ men are able to live the good life, right? Just go <laughs> ignore that part. Go push through it. <laughs> I think your advice has been amazing so far. So um, I think one topic which is very, very interesting is um, your time in, in journalism, because um, let, let's talk a little bit about the Trump campaign, because I know you, you have gotten a lot of heat for it. And um, I think that most people would, would get a deep depression when they would uh, switch switch positions with you you know what i mean so yes. <laughs> so speak a little bit about your mindset in, in 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 this area and maybe you could also speak how your time in the army and as a lawyer maybe have helped you in in in, in during those hard times right or hard you, you you know what i mean yeah yeah no they psychologically being a prominent trump supporter which isn't how i position myself now but i was for a time psychologically that was among the most difficult challenges in my life exactly. because you're, you're, it's a psychological onslaught. If you shouldn't care, but you do care, you're, we're all plugged into this, this <laughs> brain, right? Yeah. Like who cares? You know, somebody's calling me a mad name or made a video of me. Who, who cares? Right. But when it first happens, it's a novel experience. And there was, there was a time, I think it was February, 2017, where I just collapsed on my bed and I, I felt like just the weight of the world upon me. And then I just got back up because of all the mindset principles. So for me, th there's a lot of people I don't want to name names, but you notice that most of the people who I've been around over the years have broken down, right? Yeah. I'm still here. Nobody would have said, how is this guy still here? Well, because, I, because of all the mindset stuff, anyone else would have been completely broken. 
by what That's was what I mean exactly. Most people would would be in a deep, deep, deep depression, right? <laughs> so yeah, and I was for like I don't know forty five seconds. I was just I just lay there and I <laughs> really did feel. There's Nietzsche has a point of like the weight of the world and gravity is very poetic. The line of I, I maybe in Zarathustra, but I found that I felt it where I felt like I was literally being pulled into the bed, and all of my body was just co collapsing upon itself as if I'd weighed a thousand pounds. And then the mindset kicks in. Then the mindset training kicks in. What are you gonna do? You're gonna sit here and cry yourself to sleep, bro. Right? That's the way you start to. Th you, what am I gonna do? Sit here? I'm gonna cry, be a little baby. I, people rely on me. I have audience. People, I have to look strong for my people. I can't look weak. I have to show leadership. So then you you have to get up and and then you and then you the mindset training kicks in even on a meta level where you say. This is a great opportunity for me to face a new challenge and overcome it and live a life. Most people, like I've been on 60 Minutes in front of 15 million people, won that exchange. I've been profiled in every major American publication, foreign publication, da, 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 you name it. And it's usually not nice glowing profiles. And I thought, how many people in their lives will ever be able to say that they've they've done this? So this is my way of using the mindset principles to face new challenges. And then I pushed through it and got through it. And it's been pretty great ever since. Ironically, the reason I've been getting out of media and journalism is not the attacks from the media anymore, just the ingratitude from the people that I sacrifice so much for. Just the, what have you done for me lately stuff? Whereas people like you and people who listen to this podcast are like great guys. So I can talk to people like you or I can have ingrates yell at me and scream at me and attack me. So I got out of <laughs> politics and media, not because of the attacks on me by, by you know, the it's media or whatever. For people, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you make it look so easy, my man. Give our listeners the secret to, to having the right mindset, right? I know they should read your book, and I recommend to everyone to, to purchase Gorilla Mindset. I think it's a fantastic read. I've bought it like two or three years ago. I don't know when you've published it, or uh, like 2015 or when? Yeah, when have 15, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a very, very, very great book. But um, let, let's give our listeners something practical. So, so, yeah, what would be your advice on having the right I know we can only give them the big picture, right? And um, yeah, speak a little bit to that. Yeah, so guerrilla mindset is two two fundamental divisions within it, two divisions within yourself. Defense, offense. Most people, you have to just learn how to play defense. Okay, my life, I'm depressed. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sad. I'm angry. I'm lonely. I'm jealous. I'm whatever. I'm a flawed person. Well, you have to learn how to get through those first. Same thing with, with when the media attacks you, you have a novel experience. You just got to survive, right? So the, the, the first thing you have to do is just the number one way to just, just survive is you just reframe everything. I'm being attacked. Oh, well, what a great opportunity for me to know what it's like to be attacked like this. What a great opportunity for me to challenge my mind and body in new and unique ways. What a, everything to me is just what a great opportunity. That's how I wake up every day. Anytime, because I don't have, I haven't had an easy day since 2015. When I was when I was living with Victor Pride, it was an easy life. The, the blogging life, I should go back to that. It was <laughs> sitting in Thailand drinking beer, right? <laughs> worked for worked for two hours a day. It was it was utopia. Uh, it was I don't know if it would have remained the Shangri La forever, but. I would. And we we all miss your your old blog content, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would I would wake up, get on a moto bike, moto 20, 20 minutes to a cafe, drink pour over coffee, write for two to four hours, close my laptop, and then whatever. Sounds like heaven to me. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Why did I leave that? Because I didn't know I was an idiot. I it was like I said early on, is I'm too open to things. Like oh. Why don't I just go into this political world? What could possibly go wrong, right? Well, everything could possibly go wrong. Uh, that said, I have submitted myself as a historical figure, undoubtedly, and that in a way it's neat. But I, but the biggest issue I struggle with every night, literally every night, is it's like, why did you do this to yourself, man? Why did you ever? 
Because <laughs> I know what that I know what a, the good life looks like. Yeah. I'm on a moto. I'm just cruising <laughs> around. Not a care in the world. For three hours, right? <laughs> and the money just comes in every month. Just boom, 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 <laughs> hits. Book sales huge. Just e easy, easy, easy life. And the headaches on Twitter, right? And the mainstream media and and the and the the censorship and you know you name it. So I just went to the gym and. It was so I do think about that. I'm like, man, what did you what did you ever do? But that's also why I've been getting away from that world. But it's kind of like steering the Titanic, right? When you're when it's just you and a blog, you can take it in any kind of direction. But for me, I've been steering it for like a year, and I'm mostly out. I'm mostly away from the iceberg. And mostly, year, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> what you do is I had to get hoaxed out. So I couldn't fully leave the media world until Hoax was out. I had an obligation to my Kickstarter, but I was actually thinking about this last night. One so of the, for everyone who doesn't know Hoax, you, you could also speak a little bit about the movie, right? Yeah, I did a movie about fake news. I always wanted to do a beautiful film. And the way, what I always tell people is my answers don't always satisfy people because people often want very... Uh, the five-step plan, right? <laughs> yeah, or they want fake answers, right? Yeah. They'll say, well, why did you make a movie? And I'll say, well, every douchebag moves to L.A., Los Angeles, and says he's going to write a book and make a movie. They never do. I wanted to do both. <laughs> and, and that, that what, what do you think of Osho, right? Yeah. They, they, they want something that they believe is more spiritual, but <laughs> it really comes down to an uh, interesting challenge. I wanted to write an amazing, timeless book. Why? I don't know why. We don't know why we want to do what we want to do. You can wrap it up and you can tell a story and I can say, well, I wanted to give back and you know, I was talented. There's, I could concoct a story easily. A lot of it is just, why'd you climb the mountain? It was there. Don't, no, yeah. but what's the deeper, let us unravel your psyche. <laughs> I was there. I wanted to do it. Yeah. Same way with hill sprints. I see a hill. I run up it. Halfway up, I'm about to die. And there's no reason I need to run all the way to the top of the hill because it's like, okay, I've achieved my lactate threshold by all objective measures. I push myself, but I'm like, I'm not going to stop. I, I don't care if I'm falling over, right? But I'm going to go to the top of yeah. the hill. Same thing with all this. And I wanted to make a movie, a beautiful movie, a movie on fake news, which I did. But I couldn't leave the media world before the film was out. That would be betraying, you know, everybody who backed it, supported it, your directors, and you named it. But now that that film is out, it's been a huge success. I'm in between projects in the sense where I'm now finishing Audacity, my book that your breeders are going to love. Everybody who loved the old Cernovich is going to be blown away by this. Oh, and, oh, 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 spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> now I can get to that, finish that up, and then I'm going to be completely out of the political media world and into this back in a way I'll be back to doing what I was doing before, but at a much higher level. So, it, you know, there, I always, it's always funny when I read these little comments on message boards, that's why I don't post on message boards where people are like nitpicking me. And I'm thinking I've reported from the white house. I've made a member of Congress resign. I've broken some of the biggest stories in the world. I've been on 60 minutes and won the exchange of written books that have sold hundreds of thousands of copies, made great films. I don't want anything to do with these little – they're such <laughs> low-level people, they don't even know what a high level is. Yeah. They don't even know what peak performance is. But now I can come back, and the people who are real know, okay, you're not just some guy – not that they ever thought that, but if you ever thought I was just some guy on the internet who could write cool things but wasn't really living it, well, okay, F-U-C-K-U. -U. Any, anybody <laughs> who's a doubter now can, can go away. <laughs> so um, you have already spoil, spoil, spoiled your, your, your upcoming book. So speak a little bit about your upcoming book, Audacity. And also, maybe you could share like the two or three big um, concepts of the book. So, so um, yeah. Yeah, so Audacity is how to go from nobody to somebody. Okay. And I'm going to do what you should never do, which is I'm going to do two volumes. The first volume is 100% mindset. The second volume is 100% we're going into the weeds. How do you make an email list? What's the call to action on your email? What is an A just into the weeds of online and offline business? 
So if you have an online business or offline business, you'll read this and think, I, I had no idea about that. I didn't even know about that. I didn't even think about that. But not everybody needs that. <clears throat> so some people, they just need believing in themselves and realizing the power of believing in yourself, the power of storytelling, the power of narrative framework. And they, they're going to read volume one and they'll be fine. Other people, maybe they don't even need that. Maybe they're just saying, oh, I have my books aren't selling like they should. Why not? Well, do you know how to do an opt-in offer? Do you know how to do a funnel? Do you know how to give away a, a free PDF of your book chapter and get people on your email list and to read the first chapter? And then if they've read it, well, oh, I had no idea. Most authors don't have any idea. So maybe you, you have all this stuff already and you're good to go, but you don't even know what a sales funnel is. You don't know what to call that. You don't know anything. And they'll read volume two. And then people like you and people like me, if I were your age, I'd read volume one and volume two. Yeah. So I'm going to release it, two books, two different covers. First one is going to be Gorilla Mindset on steroids. And then the second one, because <laughs> Gorilla Mindset was a very much a practical how-to guide. It wasn't a motivational book. I don't think you read Gorilla Mindset and you feel motivated, right? I Not feel like you, right, you read it and you're like, oh, holy. Practical, God. something you can immediately lose, right? So. Yeah. It's like a manual for your mind. You read it and you're like, okay, yeah, I never thought about that. I'm going to do that. But you're not like fired up, charged up. Let's go do this great thing. <laughs> you don't read Gorilla Mindset before deadlifting, right? You read it at a different, different time. But Audacity is just like, come on, come get some. Here's how to do it. Okay, Much more great. So, so basically mind. you're giving um, all of our listeners and, and your audience the blueprint on um, how to be someone, right? Yeah, how to go from nobody to somebody, which, just, yeah, I, I love that title. Everybody I've talked to loved it. Nobody wants to admit they're too. nobody and want to be somebody, but F you. Admit it, you do. Yeah, F you, right? of course. Not, of course. <laughs> yeah. If I wanted to lie to people, I'd be, be doing politics, right? Just admit it. <laughs> and it's catchy. It has itself, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, have to, I don't have time for people who are like, well, I don't know. I don't, yeah, you do. You want to be somebody. Everybody wants to be somebody. And, and that somebody doesn't mean, you know, international level, but you want to be somebody in your own life, in your community, in your family, in your school, in your church, wherever you are. And that's what we talk about the book is I would not, my advice to, to young men listening to this is I would not advise you to do what I do and to play the game at the level I played. It's not that fun. It's not worth it. I would advise you to play the level of the game I did when I was 30, you know, six. <laughs> I just had a good thing. Why did I blow that, right? And the, the, the flip side of that is those guys get bored. So you never know, too. You can never, like Tim Ferriss, I sometimes watch videos. And you can tell his heart's not into it. He's kind of phoning it in. Uh, oh, here's five life hacks. And th there isn't that just yeah, from the height. And, and that probably would have happened to me too, where, hey, guys, we're going to talk about to, how to get motivated about <laughs> life. Here's, so I don't even know that I could have remained at that level. But, but that said, when I was just some, just some guy with a blog, I actually made way more money than I do now. So, oh, really? And oh, I, I, it, it, it was a golden age of blogging. I don't know that oh, anybody could do crazy. it. Crazy. Yeah, I had that juicing so, blog. Much smaller, right? There weren't that many blogs. Nobody really knew how to do affiliate marketing. People weren't on social media, so people would read blogs. It is hard to get people, even with a big Twitter following like mine, it is hard to get people for, off of social media onto another platform. But before the, the social media monopoly, that's what people do. You had email lists, you had a blog. And everybody would read your blog. And if everybody's on your blog, they're all going to click and go buy, buy things. Yeah. But when they're on social media, like even on Facebook, if you click on a link to my blog, you don't go to my blog. Facebook just loads up the post and you go, oh, cool post. What else is on Facebook today? Right. Completely, completely changed. And moreover, my audience is 10 times bigger, but it's not a converting audience. Okay. It was, oh, you know, tell me the latest scoop in the White House. Well, those people aren't going to read Gorilla Mindset. Yeah, right? they, they, they don't buy shit, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a deadbeat audience. I've told them that. And then they get <laughs> mad that I call them a deadbeat audience. And, I'm, and they're like, how dare you? I'm like, I don't need your votes. You know, I don't need your deadbeats. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't want anything to do with you people. I only want people who just wake up and like they want to get it. 
And then, of course, to me, it's like, come on, uh, 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 Grill Mindset's nine ninety nine. Shut up, right? Le- leave me alone. You know, they go, oh, you're monetizing the Trump base. <laughs> oh God, no. I never. Those people were never uh, wanting to, to be better out of life. They want to complain about. You know, you name it, who. And then, of course, the left is the same way. They want to blame about. You, everybody wants to blame someone else. It's just a different group of people that you want to blame. And the real, you know, butt kickers or whatever are we're back in the golden golden age of blogging. And they just wanted to, to make it happen in life. And that's a, so the audience was much smaller, but it converted way, way, way better. Right. Yeah. So um, I think this episode was so, so, so amazing. I'm so grateful for you being here on the podcast. Um, at the end, I always ask two personal questions. But before I ask those two personal questions, I would love to hear your best advice on building a personal brand long term. So, um, yeah, just... just well, uh, you can all, so your personal brand is you can only write about what you're doing and... You, that's why a lot of people, they get stale. They don't do new things in life. And then there's a new hot up and coming person who's the new it, the it kid, so to speak. And if you want to build a personal brand, you have to, there, there's a, I can't remember who said it, but they said either, either become a writer or live a life worth writing about. And as a personal brand, you're doing both. You're writing about a life worth writing about. So I see a lot of these people, oh, I want to, you know, I want to do like a personal brand, but they're just living very boring, mediocre lives. They're not pushing themselves. Nobody wants to read a mediocre, boring life. You have to really push yourself, really challenge yourself. And you have to write about your failures too, because that's part of the process. I've written about, you know, mistakes. Plus people love what I call uh, mistake porn. The 10 biggest business mistakes I ever made. That's going to get way more clicks than why I have hot women all over around me all the time, you know, <laughs> people really love that mistake porn. And if you're building a personal brand, you have to be authentic with your audience and you have to be fully transparent. So I would say you have to, one, you have to write about a life worth writing about. Okay. Two is you have to be open and transparent. Three is you have to be authentic. Great advice. So um, before we jump into those question uh, where can people work with you where can they find you where can they uh, buy your books and yeah well the best place to go is just cernovich.com now everything's there c-e-r-n-o-v-i-c-h.com the you, you can find the links to host and gorilla mindset and i have a master class which was really good i need to step in <clears throat> speaking of mistakes i released a master class and it sold well but i never created an affiliate program for it just because i was so busy with like so many other things but that's a mistake, right? Um, it's a huge mistake, but that's why in Audacity Part Two, Volume Two, it's like a checklist. Okay, you have it doesn't take that long to create an affiliate program. It takes thirty minutes, but you're you get in the mind. Okay, I got it. I'm out. I'm I'm running and gunning. I got this other thing going on too. Like no, no, no. You got to do an affiliate program. But most people, maybe who are leasing, don't even know what an affiliate program is. Yeah. And so th- there's a number of things. Even when you play the game at a high level things fall through the cracks so i have yeah i have a mindset master class which people have loved and it sold well i haven't even hardly promoted it. a lot of people don't even know i have one and you can find all that at cernovich.com <laughs> guy make fun to check uh mike's stuff out so um the first question would be what have you learned in the last two years that excite you the most? And it could be like about health, about fitness, about um, personal relationships, about your business. And some guests have shared like something deeply, deeply personal. So um, just feel free to talk about whatever you want to. So what have I learned in the past two years that excited me the most? Yeah. Probably that the hard work does pay off. And what I mean by that is when you're when you're creating something like a film or writing a book or releasing a new project or reaching a new level, it isn't fun most days. It's pretty demoralizing. You're going to be full of self-doubts. Why am I doing this? I could have just done something else. This is this is absurd. What am I doing? And but the hard work really does pay off. And that's something you don't appreciate when you're young because you don't see the results for years and years and years. So you're like, oh, I read 20 books this year, but I'm still broke. 
well, I know you might be broke for five more years, right? You might, or I don't know my purpose yet, or I'm still not. Yeah, it takes three to five years to have a really nice body. And then that's if you're really training hard, which most people aren't training hard. Or you are black. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> black, black, black I can't say that, boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, that the the hard work the hard work does pay off, and in terms of making it, I always think which people have to know, especially which again is harder when you're younger. Is when you make it, you forget all the bad stuff behind you. That's why when I think about oh, I grew up poor, bullied, or what, I just I don't even think about that stuff anymore because your your mind becomes like rewired, and then you tend to enjoy what you have, and. When you're not making it, though, you you tend to focus on all those negative events and experiences. So you might not make it till you're 40 or 50, till you're 60. I don't think I I, I don't think I fully made it yet because there's still things that I want to do. I think I've done okay uh, by hey, objective that, that was <laughs> but You got high standards, right? I'm always thinking in terms of I want by the time I'm 50, I want to write have written a great novel, not a good novel, not a good story, which I could do right now, a great novel. And that'll be the culmination of everything that I've learned about the world that I can communicate in a fictional setting. And yet it'll have truth. So th there are still things that I'm, I'm planning to do. And that keeps you from uh, been there, done that syndrome, right? A lot of people have it. Oh, started a business. Okay. Well, good. Then go do something new, right? Most people don't yeah. think that way. And then they're just sort of bored and jaded because they feel like they've been there, done that. But there's so much more to do, and we'll never be able to do everything possible or everything to experience in life. <laughs> I love this. So the last question would be, um, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? I, well, I wrote an article, a letter to my 25-year-old self. I, it's, it's a great, great, great article. Right? I, I've read it like twice or, or three times. Yeah, the... The, that mindset, I wish I would have known. I didn't even know. That nobody even talked about the term mindset. And then people say mindset is everything, which I don't really like. So I would say, I would just say mindset is learnable. How you feel is learnable. It's a skill. It's a skill that's teachable. It's a skill that's learnable. If you're angry or jealous or whatever feelings, I, you know, when I was in my 20s, early 20s, I, yeah, I'm hard to imagine what I felt, but I probably felt insecure. Just the same issues everyone has young men especially, and you just learn, okay, you don't have to feel this way. You don't have to feel this way. But what everybody tells you on how not to feel that way is like BS. Well, you don't have to be angry. Oh, well, thanks, bro. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's deep. Great That's advice. Deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's learnable. It's learnable. It's teachable. That said, you do have to find the right approach. So me, Gorilla Mindset is for more introverted, contemplative, philosophical people, but that might not be the right approach. Other people would love the Gary Vee stuff. They just want to feel amped up. And that's fine too. There's no there's no wrong answer, but it is learnable. It is teachable. And if one approach isn't resonating with you after two or three months, try another one. And moreover, I would tell my 20-year-old self, you will figure it out. My, maybe not today, maybe not next year, but you will Eventually. figure it out. I love this. This episode was so great. Thank you very much for, for being on the show. Um, yeah. Talk My to pleasure, you. man. <laughs>